Thank you this morning. Um, the title of my talk, uh, of my first talk here is Hamilton's Rule. And Hamilton's Rule is a very, very famous rule, sort of that is kind of well known to everybody who works in sociobiology, who works in evolution that has to do with social interactions. It was first formulated in, the, in 1964, actually, by Bill Hamilton in his PhD thesis. And it has sort of inspired much work over the years. And there are many thousands of papers that would refer to this rule and that would uh, somehow put results in context with this rule. And there are also many papers written out there that would say Hamilton's rule predicts, it makes predictions about social situations, about evolution. And um, I want to review these claims with you today um, because the outcome of our analysis of this rule is actually very surprising. So Hamilton's rule states that um, a trait will evolve, so a trait will be favored by natural selection if benefit times relatedness is greater than cost. So B times R is greater than C. If benefit times relatedness is greater than cost, then natural selection will favor a trait. What kind of traits are we talking about? A kind of trait where I do something in order to help somebody else. There's a famous quote by GPS Holden. Holden was a founding father of population genetics, but apparently in a pub conversation, and Maynard Smith remembers that, he was asked, would you risk your life in order to save somebody? And then he made some calculations on a napkin and then he said, I will jump into the river to save two brothers or eight cousins. Meaning kind of that my coefficient of relationship with my brother is one half. If I risk my life, then I better save two brothers. Or in other words, if I have a 50% chance of losing my life, I would do it for a brother. My coefficient of relationship with a cousin is one eight, so I better save eight cousins or I risk one-eighth of my life to save a single cousin. Uh, Holden also uh, actually said uh, in an interview, in the two occasions in his life when he really had to jump in to save somebody from a river, uh, from drowning, he didn't have enough time to make that calculation. <laughs> but here, uh, that's the kind of trait we're talking about. The kind of trait we're talking about is, for example, in the world of social insects, very common. Here are beautiful photos by Alex Wild. Please look at his website. He makes the most beautiful photos of insects that uh, you can imagine. And here you have bees and here you have ants. And um, what is happening in those uh, insects is that they are workers and workers do not reproduce. They help another offspring reproducing, that's the queen. Already Darwin asked himself the question, how can my theory of natural selection explain a perfectly formed worker if the worker doesn't reproduce, if my theory is about reproduction, about how to make better offspring, so organisms adapt in order to make better offspring, how can I get a perfect worker if the worker leaves no offspring at all? Instead, the worker helps the queen reproduce. And in some sense, Darwin already anticipated the kind of answer that the natural selection is on the queen, which also makes the worker. Um, but formally, it was uh, sort of formulated and related to this idea of Hamilton's rule. Um, because the worker pays a cost, the cost is not reproducing, the queen has a benefit, the benefit then has offspring, and the worker and the queen are related. So it seems that Hamilton's rule is a kind of perfect um, explanation of these kind of situations that you're looking at here. So that's what we're talking about, social evolution. Um, as we said, uh, Hamilton's rule, a trait is favored by natural selection if benefit times relatedness is greater than cost. Uh, slightly more accurate, the uh, rule is actually formulated, the change in average trait value is proportional to PR minus C. So we imagine a trait to help somebody else, and the change in average trait value is supposed to be proportional to PR minus C. Question, when is this true? Because as a theoretician, you're sort of very much used, you're presented with something very beautiful, and the first thing that you would always be on your mind, that's amazing, you know, something so simple, when is it true? A very natural question to ask for a theoretician. Sorry, what do you mean to change? Change, say, from one generation to the next, that's a little bit underspecified, one time step to the next, but maybe one generation to the next, you can think of it like that. Okay. So very natural question for a theoretician, when is this true? The answer is surprising. The answer by proponents of Hamilton's rule is always. This is absolutely always true. 
that's already amazing, you know, because if something is a statement about the natural world, the natural world is complicated. Normally, you would think it holds in certain cases, cannot possibly be held in everything. No, but the proponents of Hamilton's rule say it's always true. More precisely, in a letter, actually, that was signed by more over, over 100 people in Nature in response to the paper that I had with Corinna Darnitz and Ed Wilson, the authors of this letter signed the statement, Hamilton's rule is as general as the genetic theory of natural selection. In that paper, we pointed out that inclusive fitness was very limited and that inclusive fitness was not a theory you need to explain social insects. Um, the response was sort of in some sense to sidestep the inclusive fitness weakness, but to point out that Hamilton's rule has no limitations. So the statement is whenever you have a mathematical theory for the formulation of population genetics or anything like this, that is as general as Hamilton's rule. And that cannot be because the genetic theory of natural selection talks about many, many things that have absolutely nothing to do with Hamilton's rule. So Hamilton's rule cannot possibly be as general as the genetic theory of natural selection and mean something. So here are two problems. Either it is as general and it doesn't mean anything, or it actually means something and then it cannot be as general. So we will see which of these two it actually is. It is not only claimed by the proponents of the rule that Hamilton's rule is always true, but also it makes many predictions. So if something is always true, sort of you would think it cannot actually make predictions. But both statements are claimed by the proponents of the rule. It is always true and it makes important predictions about evolution. And intuitively, that cannot be. So the predictions that you will find in many, many papers, in many papers you will, write, you will read sentences like this. Hamilton's rule predicts that cooperation is more likely between relatives. Because if the relationship is sort of closer, is higher, then sort of this PR is easier, PR greater than C is easier to fulfill. Holding B and C fixed while increasing R favors cooperation. Haplotiploidy favors eusociality. This was actually a very early so-called prediction of the theory that led Ed Wilson to purchase fully into it in the 60s, because in the 60s, most cases of eusociality that were known, eusociality is the phenomenon that we saw on the slides where workers do not reproduce but help the queen reproducing. Most cases of eusociality that were known in the 60s were haplotiploid genetics. Only termites were diploid genetics. And by, by all termites, we are the exception that proves the rules. But later, and so the theory at that time predicted that haplotiploidy favors eusociality because of some arguments that were there about relationship between the evolved uh, individuals. Then it was discovered there are many origins of eusociality in the diploid species, not only actually termites. And then it was reformulated that the rule actually no longer predicts that haplotiploidy favors eusociality. Instead, it was said it is equally favorable by haplotiploidy or diploidy. So this is a kind of prediction that was taken back. Another prediction is single mating of queen favors sterile workers. So a queen that forms a colony can actually mate once or several times with, a, with one male or with several males. And the, the idea is that if a queen mates only with one male, then there's a stronger selection pressure that workers do not lay eggs. Workers can lay eggs, unfertilized eggs, they can make male offspring. So in a colony, female offspring can only come from the queen, but male offspring could come from the workers and the queen, and there could be a fight between the queen and the workers over who makes the male offspring. And sort of a, a, an a apparent or a claimed prediction of the theory is that if the queen has mated only once, then the workers prefer not to lay uh, male offspring. Another prediction is multiple matings of the queen favors policing. So policing is a phenomenon where workers lay eggs and other workers come and destroy the eggs. The worker laid eggs. And finally, only published very recently, was actually the prediction more aggression. Uh, Hamilton's rule predicts that there's more aggression toward relatives. Now that should surprise you very much because that seems to be counter to the whole intuition about Hamilton's rule because you should be friendlier to your relatives because then it works with this PR minus C ratio. Uh, but in that paper, the empirical observation is that there was more aggression toward relatives. It, I think it was in a species of banded mongrels. 
And so then the author said that's absolutely in accordance with Hamilton's rule because if I'm aggressive toward the relative, the relative is less likely to resist. Um, and so you see that Hamilton's rule somehow is used for many, many predictions and they always seem, to me, they seem extremely arbitrary. So it seems to me that if I start the sentence Hamilton's rule predicts, I can continue the sentence in whatever way I like. <laughs> and most of those so-called predictions are actually not really based on calculations. But the calculations exist and the calculations that we will see in this talk make it very, very clear that Hamilton's rule cannot possibly make any prediction. I think that is, that is what will become clear once we look at the mathematics. So I will show that Hamilton's rule makes no prediction and cannot be tested empirically. And the question is then what is the mathematics of Hamilton's rule and how does one prove Hamilton's rule? So Hamilton's rule is such a well-known concept, but most people would be extremely hard-pressed if you would ask them, please prove Hamilton's rule to me. How does one prove Hamilton's rule? You have to look very carefully in the literature to see the so-called derivations of Hamilton's rule and to understand actually how they work. And that's what, what we are doing here. So I use the general version of Hamilton's rule. It's called Hamilton's rule general. And this is the exact general and canonical version of Hamilton's rule by its proponents. So it is not that I'm inventing something here or I'm adding anything. I'm just presenting the mathematics that has been developed by the most enthusiastic proponents of Hamilton's rule. And they call this exact general and canonical. If you don't use that version of Hamilton's rule, you're actually not really mainstream. There's something you don't quite understand. And that version of Hamilton's rule was first proposed in a paper in 1992. But claims over that version of Hamilton's rule got stronger over the years. A whole book was written about it. And sort of that this idea is the foundation of every understanding in sociobiology that sort of is very well documented in those papers. I mean, claimed in those papers. So here is how the derivation works. We have a population of size n. And in that population, we label the individuals 1 to n. Each individual gets a trait value. The trait value could be a genetic value. It could be, for example, an allele that is sort of either there or not there. Or it could be some numerical value. So the trait value of individual 1 is g1, g2 is 2, up to n. Each individual gets assigned a fitness value. And the fitness value is w1 to wn. So here is an illustration of this setup. I have a population, say a population of cells or animals or insects, whatever you like. And in this population, uh, I have a certain size. And I have two traits here. That's a very simple setup. I have the trait blue, which I call 1. And red is zero, my population size is eight. And um, I make, uh, this individual makes three offspring, this individual makes two offspring, and this individual makes three offspring. All the other individuals make no offspring. And my total population size is constant. I don't have to do this, but it simplifies a little bit the formulas. So we work in a realm of constant population size here. So this eight, eight, and the next generation also eight. Then if I have this situation here, I can write down the data that describe that situation. So that individual here has three offspring. It's this individual here, and it has, it has that um, G value, that genotype uh, value that is one. And this individual has zero offspring, zero, and it's also of type one, trait value one. This individual has two offspring, trait value one. Trait value zero, zero offspring, zero, and so on. So I just describe with this table what is happening here. Very clear. And then I just some notation, the average trait value. The average trait value is one over n, sum over the trait values. That's my average trait value in the population. Then the average trait value in the next generation is again one over n times the sum over wi gi. So this is the individual, the offspring of individual i. They all inherit the trait value. So then I have that many individuals with that trait value in the next generation, and then I average over this. So this is my average trait value now. That's the average trait value in the next generation. The difference in that's the change in average trait value. The change in average trait value is what I have in the next generation minus what I have now, and this can be written like this. And you can also use the notation of covariance to actually describe this. So this is the covariance between G and W. And some people like these covariance formulations. I find them a little bit non-transparent, but these covariance formulations are kind of liked. 
um, if you actually know, uh, this is the so-called price equation. And sometimes the people attribute some significance to the price equation, but it's just using the notation of covariance. Under what random sort of generative model? Is it no, model? no model, that's the problem. That's exactly the problem. So you put your finger right on the problem. I, so the, the people who like this method, they say, I don't need to specify any model. I just, I just, this is just always true. So what I've written down here is always true. You are free to plug in any model you like, any data set you like so far, right? That's exactly where the problem lies. That's exactly where the problem lies. <clears throat> so here nothing wrong has happened, right? Nothing wrong. I mean, I've just used some notation. Uh, this is just using notation. And now I have to use a little bit more notation, you know, but it's all, all sort of very trivial. So the mean of, of a value, so it's the, the numbers AI, that the mean is the average here, very clear. Then that's the variance. So that's the sum over AI squared minus the mean to the square. And then the covariance between two values is that formula. Again, just, I just use notation. You know, I'm not, there's nothing wrong that is happening here. And now I will show you that Hamilton's rule is precisely that. The change in average trade value divided by the variance of the trade value, we will be able to write it as BR minus C. And this is, again, this is not my invention. This is the exact general and canonical version of Hamilton's rule that I'm just presenting here. Most papers that present the rules, they kind of they hide the details. So for most readers, it is not as apparent as I try to make it. But I'll try to make it very apparent. But it is exactly what is uh, described there. So we need to know what are those things B, R, and C. So what should be B, R, and C? So something else has to happen because they have to do about interactions. There has, there has to be something about interactions in my data set. So I have so far only talked about fitness values, trade values, and I now, I now will add one more thing, and that's the trade value of the interaction partner. So for individual one, the, the average trade value of interaction partner is H1. I could interact with one partner or with several. So either I take the trade value of the one interaction partner I have or the average trade value of all the interaction partners that I have. I just add this to my setup. So now we had this before and we want to add interaction because Hamilton's rule is about social interaction. So we, let's suppose binary interaction. We don't have to do it, but it would be very simple. So let's suppose this individual interacts with that individual, this individual interacts with this, and now I have my social interactions. And now I described this situation here by those three columns. I had to add the third column, and the third column is the trade value of the interaction partner. So this individual, for example, has an interaction partner with trade value one, therefore it's one here. This individual here has a trade value with interaction zero, therefore this is zero here. So it's sort of very, yes? What units are interaction value? That's, com that's completely arbitrary. That's, that, that, that is completely arbitrary. That's, because it is as general as anything you like. So we don't, we don't limit ourselves. The, uh, the interaction partner does not get attributed to the offspring as well? No, no so, far, so far I just have described something. So I haven't yet made a claim. We will, we will go to that. So I, I just say that this is what I need in order to formulate Hamilton's rule. How you want to describe those interactions that is not needed to specify Hamilton's rule. The offspring is only assigned to one interaction partner and not to the other as well. Um, basically, this individual has three offspring. So I jump into the river and then you have three offspring. These are your offspring. You know, in some sense, inclusive fitness tries to assign the offspring to the interaction partner, but that will come. Also, interaction is not necessarily mating. Partner. No, no, it's not mating. It is. It can be anything. You, it can be. I help you. You know, I. So, so uh, sorry, I'm still confused on why there's only three ones in the H column, uh, but there are four edges. Uh, so in the H column. Um, we look at here, so this is a one here because that interaction partner is one. Then this guy has this interaction partner is one. And so then those here have interaction partner zero and this is the last one that has an interaction partner one. So we have three blue individuals, therefore three of the interaction partners are one. We have five red individuals here, therefore five of the interaction partners are zero. Yes. You don't allow one division to have interactions with more than one. 
I, we can also do that. That's no problem at all. That's no so which could and then that would be the average value of the interaction part. So if I have an interaction with a red one and a blue guy, maybe I would put one half here. We can also do that. So now I have those three data columns that describe my situation. And now uh, we'll make more regressions. You know, people in this field they like to make regressions, and there's nothing wrong about making regressions as long as you. Don't misinterpret them. You know, you're free to make these regressions. You know, this is, so the first thing is we have a regression of W versus fitness versus trait value. The slope of that regression, so there's actually something that went wrong here. The slope of that regression is the covariance between W and G divided by the variance. This is a well-known formula for the slope of a linear regression with vertical offset. So I make a linear regression of W versus G. I make another linear regression of W versus H, and my slope will be MWH. And here I'm using the actual data of my example. You know. And here I'm making a regression of H versus G. That's the trait value of the interaction partner versus the trait value of, of the focal individual. And I can do that either where I have the slope of, of G versus H or H versus G. They're not exactly the same slopes. We're using vertical offset. All of those slopes can be expressed as covariances divided by variances. This is just standard mathematics of linear regression. And now I have, however, these three columns, so I could also do something else. I could make a, three, a multivariate linear regression. So the next thing that I'm doing is I have a, a regression of the fitness value against the trait value and against the trait value of the interaction partner at the same time. And now with least square, I get um, a plane. And that plane has two slopes. And these slopes, let us call them capital M in the direction of G and capital M in the direction of H. That's my plane that I have here. And now, the relationship, there's a relationship between the two D slopes and the three D slopes. I have two three D slopes, and here I have, uh, I use four different two D slopes. And there's a relationship between the two D slopes and the three D slopes because we're using the same data for the three D and for the two D. And in some sense, if you know the two D slopes, you can calculate the 3D slopes by solving that linear system. This is actually a relationship. I showed it to Don Rubin at Harvard, who is sort of an expert in causality and statistics. And he immediately remembered a paper from 1897 that actually first proves that relationship. For some reason, it is not a standard tool in statistics. It doesn't seem to come up very often in, in sort of recent papers, but it is something that is well known, and at least since 1897, that there's this relationship between slopes. And now we have our Hamilton's rule, because what we will do is that this will be called minus C, this will be called B, and this is called R. And we already have proven that the slope WG is the change in trait value divided by the variance. And that is the derivation of Hamilton's rule. So Hamilton's rule is a relationship between slopes that holds mathematically. The slopes that we used here is capital MG, MH, and then the fitness versus G, and then the H versus G, we have both of them, I think. Do those quantities have those interpretations? That is, that is completely interesting, you know, it's just interesting. They, ju they, they just, they like to call this BNC, but they, they do tell a story. So in some sense they say, I correlate, is a partial regression coefficient of fitness against my own trait value, and I like to call this as the cost of my trait, or minus the cost of my trait. Here I correlate my fitness against the trait value of the other individual, and that is in some sense the benefit I give to the other individual. But in, this is precisely where the problem lies, that you, by calling this cost and benefit, you give a causal interpretation to something, which is not warranted if you actually understand the statistics, the implication of regression. But so far, this is the exact derivation of Hamilton's rule that we have, and it is, it is completely true. And um, it is a mathematical statement. It is not a consequence of natural selection. It's not a consequence of biology. <coughs> so Hamilton's rule is a relationship between slopes in linear regression that holds for any data set, as long as the slopes are defined. So we need the slopes to be defined because the slopes could also non be non-existent. So let's, the slopes are defined. It's not a consequence of biology or not of natural selection. 
So therefore, if it's not a consequence of biology or natural selection, it's clear that it also cannot make any prediction. So in the same sense, if you make an experiment and I'm looking over your shoulder and I say two plus two is four, I have not said anything incorrectly. Every time you make your experiment, I remind you that two plus two is four, and I do not make any mistake here. Everything that I say is completely correct, but it also doesn't help you with your experiment or with the interpretation of your experiment. Maybe sometimes you need to calculate two plus two is four, that's fine, you know, but in principle I haven't helped you. So let us now ask, what is the activity of testing Hamilton's rule? Because actually there are many papers out there that test Hamilton's rule. What is the, prop, how do you properly test Hamilton's rule? So you use a theory, so because the people also like Hamilton's rule to say that your theory is already as predicted by Hamilton's rule. So if you want to formulate a theory that has to do with social interactions, the proponents of Hamilton's rule will come afterwards, take your result and say what you have done is exactly as predicted by Hamilton's rule. So imagine that you have a theory and the theory generates, oops, that theory generates that data set. Yes? I think I want to throw in a comment. Um, uh, you're showing very clearly a cost here, the uh, cost, say, is defined as a certain mathematical formula. But just thinking from biology, you might think the cost could be um, defined as, say, the expected loss in the number of future, uh, in the number of future offspring. I mean, now that is, now that's a biological definition. Yes, exactly. And now it's a question of whether those two things are related. Exactly, exactly correct. Exactly correct. So if you have another way to motivate benefit and cost, then you actually are about to formulate a Hamilton's rule, which is a statement, which could be right or wrong, but it's not that Hamilton's rule. That's, that's the problem. So basically, if you publish a paper and you say, here is my favorite cost and benefit definition, if your paper ends with the line, I hereby confirm Hamilton's rule, nobody has a problem with it. If you get an outcome where Hamilton's rule is sort of violated in your data set, then they would say, oh, you have made a mistake because you haven't used the correct Hamilton's rule. That is how the field actually works. So you are fine to, to do whatever you like as long as you conform with the dogma, but if you find a counterexample, then you are reminded you haven't used the correct. Um, so, so again, we use a theory or perform an experiment to generate that data set. And then we have this data set and we check whether this is as predicted by Hamilton's rule. And then every data set, biological or unbiological, empirical or theoretical, with or without mistakes, is exactly as predicted by Hamilton's rule. So you can actually measure something and I can come in overnight and make arbitrary modifications here maliciously, and the next morning your data set is still exactly as predicted by Hamilton's rule. Because it doesn't matter what is written here in this data set. So the next question would be that we understand, you know, we cannot test it empirically, we can also not make a prediction. There's still a question, could we actually learn something by calculating those parameters? So suppose you have a certain data set, and you want to learn something from those parameters. In order to answer the question whether we can learn something, we have to inspect those parameters. We have to understand how those parameters actually depend on the data set. So we can write down the actual formulas for these very important B, C, and R parameters, because we have them. You know, they are, not, they are completely given by the mathematics. So they can be expressed as variances and covariances. So the first thing we note is that problem one is that the benefit and the cost depend on R. So the benefit and the cost depend on the average relatedness in the population. So if I pay one dollar and give three dollars to Alex, it is not the case that this is minus one and plus three. In order to calculate B and C, we would have to know the relationship in the entire population. So in some sense, you could see, oh, if I have R appearing in those formulas, then the separation into meaningful components didn't work out. Something hasn't worked out here because my Hamilton's rule is actually benefit as a function of R times R is greater than C, which is also a function of R. So it is very, it is nebulous, it doesn't actually mean anything. If it would have worked out, then you could say maybe that means something, but it, it doesn't work out because it depends on R. So the next problem is, the statement is that BR minus C, so whether benefit times relatedness is greater than cost, that predicts the change in average trade value is somehow the jargon in that field. There's a problem with this also because B and C depend on the change in average trade value. 
So the parameters B and C, in order to calculate them, you must already know the change in average trade value, and you actually, the, it, the change in average trade value modifies the parameters B and C. So there's something else which didn't work out about the parameters B and C. And moreover, the value of BR minus C is actually fully specified by the W and G columns alone and does no longer functionally depend on H. So Hamilton's rule is something about interactions, about social interactions. But once you have written down fitness and trade value, the value of BR minus C is fully specified. So if, it, if I have my example from before, and now I change the H column, I use the digits of pi for my H column, I get exactly the same prediction for the change in average trade value. So Hamilton's rule would also work basically if you do something like this is the number of my papers, that's my phone number, and that's the average phone number of my five best friends or something like that. That would also be as predicted by Hamilton's rule. So the last question is, can you use Hamilton's rule to classify data into uh, four cases? So it's, some people already seem sort of to, to uh, begin to agree that Hamilton's rule cannot make a prediction, cannot be tested, but they still raise the one question, could I actually usefully classify my data into those cases? And so then the statement would be, if benefit is greater than zero and C is greater than zero, I call this altruism. Why? Because I actually pay a real positive cost for you to have a benefit, even though cost and benefit are strange parameters here. And it is mutual benefit if my cost is negative, so I get something and you have a benefit. And then spite would be I pay something to harm you. And selfishness would be I, I, I get a benefit, I get something, and you have a disadvantage of that. So the question is, could you, if you take a data set, could you at least do this in that way? But the answer is obvious. The answer would be no, because this is a causal interpretation. This is as if you are now telling a story about the process that has led to the data, and that's precisely what you cannot do with these regression methods. That's precisely what you cannot do. And therefore, when I showed Don Rubin the claim about Hamilton's rule the first time, his first question to me actually was, is this claimed by academics? He, said, he couldn't imagine that actually academics could make that claim because it is such an obvious mistake about causality and correlation. So you can easily... I, uh, my previous job was in business. And in my experience, the business people make far fewer mistakes because their money is on the line. <laughs> so, so Don has a different background. He believes the academics, but I don't. <laughs> so uh, here, I, we just generated these data sets with a model. You know, we, we, we carefully sort of generated here an example where there's an underlying model where there's clearly no altruism. But then the classification would give B is greater than C and C is greater than C, which would mean altruism. So we also generated a model where you have no mutual benefit, but it gives you, and that's very easy because of correlation is not causation. Um, so the first part of my talk is over. I just have a few more minutes to say about the remaining aspect of the controversy. So in summary, the general form of Hamilton's rule makes no prediction and cannot be tested empirically. It's not a consequence of natural selection, not a statement about biology. It cannot be used for causal interpretation of biological data. So we still have the amazing question, why does it exist? You know, how can a field even come up with something like this? This is a big question for me that, I, that I'm, sort of, I'm thinking about. And you have to understand historically. So historically, it's the following approach. Hamilton 64 proposes it in his PhD thesis as actually something very meaningful because Hamilton's proposition is a specific rule. A specific rule, kind of the one you hinted at, where I have actual benefit and cost that somehow could be understood. And then he shows that in certain cases, uh, this rule makes sense. The rule then was greatly liked by people, and somehow people thought this is a general law of biology. And then three important papers were written by important population geneticists, Brian Charlesworth, Cavalis and Feldman, and Carlin and Matesi. They actually very politely pointed out that Hamilton's rule almost never holds. So they, the specific version of Hamilton's rule where BR and C mean something is easily violated. And it's easily violated because biology is complicated, nonlinear, things are not like that. 
and so they pointed that out. But in response to this, in some sense, the field did now not say, all right, we have a really nice rule which sometimes holds and often doesn't hold. That would be the, instead, it developed into something like a cult where the field sort of needed a Hamilton's rule that always holds. So over the years, in some sense, the task of the field was to reformulate Hamilton's rule such that it always works. And that was achieved, in some sense, with that method that I, that I presented. So they indeed got a Hamilton's rule which always works, but at the price of that Hamilton's rule not meaning anything. Um, there is a second part of the controversy, and maybe that's related to your question, how to attribute offspring, and this is the question of fitness versus inclusive fitness. So for me, Hamilton's rule is one aspect of the theory, and the other aspect is inclusive fitness. So what is fitness? You know, Sometimes before we had a good mathematical description of biology, of evolutionary biology, evolutionary biology was very much a way to tell a very powerful story about how an organism looks like. So you take a certain organism and you say, why does the tree have these leaves? And then you say, the tree has these leaves because it, they are perfectly with the sunlight and then they are shaped such that the wind doesn't break them. And why? Because then the tree has more offspring. So you explain biological adaptation by telling a story about offspring. So you can explain everything by taking fitness. And that is a very powerful story if you don't have equations. Now that we actually have equations of evolution, very often we realize we wouldn't even know what fitness is, because fitness is a, sometimes a complicated concept, not a very good concept. But the fitness concept breaks down in social interactions. That's what Darwin realized, and that's what Hamilton realized in the 64. So if I ask, um, how do I explain a worker ant? I cannot really talk about fitness because the worker ant has no offspring. So Hamilton wanted to solve that problem by expanding the fitness concept into what he calls inclusive fitness. So he says in order to understand the fitness of a worker, we have to add all the sort of positive effects that she causes to her relatives. And in the 64 paper, Hamilton's rule then, Ham Hamilton proposed a definition of inclusive fitness and that is a good and meaningful definition. So he actually writes, inclusive fitness may be imagined as the personal fitness which an individual actually expresses in its production of adult offspring as it becomes after it has been first stripped and then augmented in a certain way. It is stripped of all components which can be considered as due to the individual social environment, leaving the fitness which he would express if not exposed to any of the harms or benefits of that environment. This quantity is then augmented by certain fractions of the quantities of harm and benefit which the individual himself causes to the fitnesses of his neighbors. The fractions in questions are simply the coefficients of relationship appropriate to the neighbors whom he affects. Unit for clonal individuals, one half for sips, one quarter for half sips, and so on, and finally zero for all neighbors whose relationship can be considered negligibly small. So what's going on here? He also has a formula for that in the paper. What's going on here? Um, I calculate the personal fitness of every individual. Then I take my personal fitness and I put it into additive components. I, I, I assume I can write it as in additive components and one component in my personal fitness is what benefits I'm getting from the social environment. I'll take that away. I'm only taking the part of personal fitness that is associated with my action, my action toward you, for example. And then I take what component in your personal fitness is associated with my action. And then I add this to my inclusive fitness multiplied with our relatedness. The problem is that I have to do, if I have only one action here, I still have to worry about all the others here because by increasing his fitness, he could be in competition with Alex, I could reduce your fitness. And then I also have to take into account how I reduce your fitness multiplied with our relatedness. That is inclusive fitness. And that inclusive fitness is actually a correct way to account for such effects. The only problem is it assumes additivity. It assumes that personal fitness exists, which is already sometimes not the case. And it assumes that personal fitness can be always written in additive components, which is definitely not always the case. So the counter example would be, you float in the river, I jump in and save you. A month later, you are unfortunately in the river again and Alex jumps in and saves you. And then you have three kids. If neither one of us had saved you, the three kids wouldn't exist. But because both of us were needed to cause the three kids, the three kids cannot be attributed one half to him and one half to me because it would be zero without either as non-additive. So these non-additive situations make inclusive fitness non-existent. 
That was actually proven in our 2010 Nature paper, and the proof was by Corinna Danica at that time. And that required really a lot of work. That was the substance of the paper. So the assumption is that personal fitness can be written as a sum of additive components, and the problem is most social interactions are not additive, most biological systems are actually nonlinear. So therefore, inclusive fitness does actually not exist in most biological scenarios. Also, people begin to realize, even if it exists, evolution does not maximize it, because evolution is not simply this maximum of a quantity. So many biologists still would say, please explain to me a social insect colony, why does the worker do this? And they would then say, well, it, it benefits the inclusive fitness of that worker. That is something that is very, very often used in talks. But if you would actually press them, could you calculate that inclusive fitness? They wouldn't know how to calculate that inclusive fitness. Most likely they are talking about phenomena that have this nonlinearity in there that the quantity itself doesn't actually exist. So the Hamilton's rule has a problem and the inclusive fitness has a problem. It leaves us with the question of what is kin selection because those are the two major components of so-called kin selection. And kin selection is something that is widely used as a term. But in my opinion, there's no useful mathematical theory of kin selection because those quantities, inclusive fitness and Hamilton's rule, have actually prevented a productive mathematical analysis Can of kin selection. Your inclusive yes. It's very interesting, uh, but um, uh, if you had a, um, I, I completely understand that you can't calculate in inclusive fitness from data. But if you have a model, a, a, a stochastic model, for how many children you will have, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you when um, when you jump in the river, right? You're affecting, maybe out of the model, mm -hmm. the expected number of children you have. Mm -hmm. um, in that calculation, Alex jumping in the river hardly appears because that's a low probability event. Um, after after you've jumped in, mm -hmm. then things go on, and Alex comes along, and now he's, you know, the model will calculate the change in in in, in, in progeny. But um, that's now conditional on the situation as it happens just before so Adam Stewart jumps in. I, I can, can definitely, definitely formulate a model where everything is additive. I can formulate a model where inclusive fitness exists. But I can also easily formulate a model where inclusive fitness does not exist, where it's non-additive. So if, for example, interactions are not pairwise, if it requires like three people to come together to do something, then uh, you don't have this inclusive fitness anymore. Um, also, the inclusive fitness is, is, uh, uh, stops existing if the population structure is actually not constant. For example, I have a relative, but I almost never interact with that relative. Or sometimes I interact with the relative, sometimes I don't interact with the relative. That's another way how phenomena arise when inclusive fitness becomes a problem. It is possible to have uh, a model where inclusive fitness exists, but typically it doesn't. And it certainly doesn't exist unless we are in the limit of weak selection and this sort of thing. So it doesn't exist out there. So when, when you look at social insects or so that you certainly have like many individuals need to be together. Uh, selection is not necessarily vanishingly small. Things are not additive and the concept doesn't exist. All the same, uh, your sociality did arise. Yeah, and we have a model for the evolution of your sociality in our nature paper using standard population genetics. And the amazing thing is this was the first model of that kind. You would have thought this existed already in the 60s, it didn't. The reason why such a model wasn't formulated is because the problem was already solved by inclusive oh, fitness wow. and by Hamilton's rule. And so the amazing thing is making that model for the evolution of social insects also made it clear to us that there's absolutely no calculation in evolutionary biology where you would need inclusive fitness. For a very long time, I believed, you know, if I want to calculate evolutionary interaction in populations of related individuals, I need to calculate inclusive fitness. That I thought this approximately until 2004. That's completely wrong. There's no calculation out there where I would know, where I would have to know inclusive fitness. So that's a very positive uh, uh, consequence of our finding because here's a very weird, complicated concept and the absolutely good news is you never need to worry about it. <laughs> now, um, I, I, I don't know this literature at all, but I know a little bit about literature of fitness landscapes. Is that all wrong for the same reason? No. The fitness landscape normally is uh, a literature where the fitness landscape itself is constant. In a social interaction, the fitness landscape is changing depending on what individuals are doing. 
So we are here in the world of evolutionary games. That will be my second talk. In the world of evolutionary games, of social interactions, the fitness of a type depends on what others in the population are doing. Or the fitness landscape changes as the population moves over it. In constant fitness landscape, you, you don't really have such um, things. You don't need that. So I think I'm done. Let me just see. Yeah, this is the further reading. Um, so we had this um, 2010 paper, which was also the front cover. And in that paper, we give a mathematical model for the evolution of new sociality, formulating ideas that Ed Wilson developed over 50 years, actually. Um, and then we have subsequent papers where we calculate the evolution of non-reproductive workers, uh, evolution of policing, and then we show that there's no inclusive fitness at the level of the individual again, and there's some agreement of, on this point almost. And then here's the evolution of queen control over worker reproduction. And then what I presented in my talk mostly is a 2017 BNAS paper, the general form of Hamilton's rule makes no predictions and cannot be tested empirically. And um, here are sort of the main people, the main collaborators in this endeavor. Thank you very much.